It is Wednesday, November 30th, 2022, and we're here at the Four Lakes Church of Christ tonight online on Wednesday evening to study the book of Genesis. So we are continuing on with Genesis. We'll be in Genesis chapter 26 in just a few minutes, so I want to invite you to be turning with me to Genesis chapter 26. And I think the screen, uh, the print on the screen should be big enough for us tonight, but uh, as always, it is good to have a Bible open. That way we can flip back and forth and look up other passages. So if you have that capability of having a a Bible on your phone or a, a, some other device or maybe just a actual real paper. That would be awesome as well tonight. So uh, we'll be in Genesis chapter 26 in just a moment. We're glad that you've joined us tonight. We're glad that you're here and we want to invite you to join us in person this coming Lord's Day morning at 9 30. We are getting back to our study of the book of Ephesians and then uh, be there for worship as well at 10 30 and we would love to see you. If you have any questions about class tonight give me a call or send a text to 608-224-0274 or send an email to fourlakeschurch at gmail.com. In terms of our calendar, this coming Sunday is the deadline for collecting canned pineapple for Schultz Lewis Child and Family Services. And you can bring in old cell phones as well as used inkjet and toner cartridges. And we could also use a few very sturdy boxes with lids. So that is critical. <laughs> Not just any boxes will do. These need to be capable of holding uh, tons of pineapple <laughs> in a way that can be stacked in a van that's moving along with other things. So uh, copious amounts of canned pineapple are showing up at our building already. Thank you for those of you who have helped. And uh, they've been coming in one at a time and cases at a time. Everybody has different capabilities and ability and uh, love for shopping for pineapple and for the children there at Schultz Lewis. So thank you for uh, helping with that. Uh, when the Schultz Lewis van shows up, it's often cold. It's always the first week in December. Uh, sometimes it's been snowing and so we need to have everything all packed up ready to head out the front door ready to be stacked in that van so if you're willing to uh, do some pineapple packing and uh, willing to get those items staged right inside the front door after worship this coming Sunday go for it your help is needed so as soon as we're done with the closing prayer and people start uh, exiting the building I think we can start uh, getting that stuff packed up and ready to go right inside the front door so we'll be ready when they stop by later in the week um, and we're also collecting cash and checks for the parish down there uh, fresh vegetables fruit meat that kind of thing and I think they go through the last time I heard about $500 a week with that kind of thing so if you can help if you want to sponsor a whole week that'd be great or five dollars ten dollars here and there helps a great deal as well and I've got an envelope in my Bible on Sunday that's labeled Schultz Lewis and so just get that to me I'll put that in there and I'll give that to the representative who shows up in a week or so uh, also in terms of our calendar we're looking forward to doing some bowling together as a congregation it's been a while since we've been able to do that so that'll be in a week and a half right after worship on Sunday December 11th uh, Dream Lanes pretty much right behind the fire station down across from uh, Culver's on Cottage Grove Road they've got a I think it's a pizza pit in the bowling alley if I remember correctly so bring a friend to worship that day plan on doing some bowling afterwards I'm looking forward to that and if you have any other questions get in touch with Gary or Sarah Mueller concerning the upcoming bowling fellowship uh, I'm here tonight with uh, with my beagle uh, sitting at my feet and so for the time being she is behaving which is a little bit rare for her, but I'll tell you in advance, as I sometimes do, if the UPS truck shows up, it's on. And uh, also, if you hear any barking or uh, furious scratching, <laughs> that is not me. That is, uh, that is her. And so she's joining us for our class tonight. Anyway, tonight we are back to the book of Genesis. So the book of beginnings written mainly by Moses. And we've moved on now from Abraham. And we're focusing now on the life of Isaac. So Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, we're on Isaac. And Isaac and Rebecca are now married. Isaac has purchased the birthright from his older brother uh, for the price of a bowl of stew or soup. And that brings us to Genesis chapter 26. So the first paragraph tonight, Genesis 26 verses 1 through 5. Genesis 26 verses 1 through 5. Now there was a famine in the land besides the previous famine that had occurred in the days of Abraham. So Isaac went to Gerar to Abimelech, king of the Philistines. The Lord appeared to him and said, Do not go down to Egypt. Stay in the land of which I shall tell you. Sojourn in this land, and I will be with you and bless you. For to you and to your descendants I will give all these lands. And I will establish the oath which I swore to your father Abraham. I will multiply your descendants as the stars of heaven, and will give your descendants all these lands. And by your descendants all the nations of the earth shall be blessed, because Abraham obeyed me and kept my charge, my commandments, my statutes, and my laws. 
So we have a famine, another famine, as it points out in the text. This has happened before where uh, people need to move from one place to another to survive. And several things about this chapter have happened before. And I think uh, if you've read ahead, you know where this is going. But in this case, Isaac heads to Gerar, basically the land of the Philistines. So he seems to be heading toward Egypt. However, God intervenes and specifically tells him, do not go to Egypt. So they've done that before. It didn't end well. And the main issue is that Egypt is too far from the land that God has promised. God hasn't promised you Egypt. He's promised you this land. So you need to stay close. So they need to stay there right in the area. On top of this instruction, God also gives some reassurance in the form of a promise. God will bless Isaac and will give these lands to his descendants. So God then reaffirms the oath that he had made previously with Isaac's father, Abraham. He will have many descendants. He'll give him this land. And then also through his descendants, all the nations of the earth would be blessed. Uh, at the end of this passage, we've got a reference that I mentioned a month or two ago, some new information about Abraham that we have now that we didn't have in those earlier chapters, even though it was true back then. Uh, in verse 5, we find that God originally decided to bless Abraham because Abraham obeyed me and kept my charge, my commandments, my statutes, and my laws. And that's very interesting. Uh, so yes, God does choose to bless Abraham. And, uh, but the choice is not entirely random. Um, you know, God is not just throwing a dart at a board and picking some guy to bless for no reason. And to me, in fact, it almost seems a little bit like Noah finding grace or favor in the sight of the Lord. And so again, there is uh, something to this, not just a completely random choice here, but Noah was righteous. And in the same way, it seems uh, that Abraham was righteous as well. So maybe something similar going on with the choice of Abraham as we had with the choice of Noah. And the other interesting thing here is that God apparently had commandments, statutes, and laws many years before the law of Moses. And I know sometimes it's very easy to forget this, and we may wonder why that's significant. Uh, years ago, we had a man try to teach some really uh, bizarre things, including teaching that outsiders today are subject to the law of Moses. And so, like, your neighbor is guilty of not keeping the Sabbath because that's the law that they're under until they're under the law of Christ. Well, totally ridiculous. Um, but anyway, part of this argument, at least from his point of view, was that the law of Moses was God's original law. And there was no law before the law of Moses. He was very specific in saying that. And so when we referred to this passage in those discussions with the man, he had no answer to it. And the reason is, the truth is, God has always had some kind of laws. Um, some kind of commandments, some kind of instructions for people to follow. You may remember even in the Garden of Eden, Adam and Eve had some laws, didn't they, in, a, in effect? Basically, laws, commandments, instructions, uh, with some consequences tied to those. Uh, on the positive side, remember they were told to populate the earth. They were told to tend or manage the garden. And then on the negative side, they were not to partake of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And so that's a commandment. That's a law, in effect. And I'm just hoping we notice here that Abraham followed God's laws even before many people realized God actually had laws for people to follow. Uh, remember, we're still in that time that we've described as the patriarchal age, where God often communicated through heads of households, heads of families. Uh, the Mosaical age hasn't come on the scene yet. That's coming with, obviously, Moses and the law on Mount Sinai. And the patriarchal age will continue from Moses up until the time of the cross, the time of Christ, for a vast majority of uh, obviously the Jewish people, but the vast majority of people in the world, they're uh, following the law of the heart, or they're still under the patriarchal age, we might say, up until the time of the cross. Of course, at the time of the cross, everybody, Jew and Gentile, is subject to the law of Jesus. Uh, but I'm just saying it's kind of interesting here. We have a reference to Abraham following God's laws, uh, even though we really don't know what that law or what those laws were. We don't have a record of that, at least in great detail. So that's kind of an interesting note here. So let's continue on with uh, Genesis 26, verses 6 through 11. Genesis 26, verses 6 through 11. So Isaac lived in Gerar. When the men of the place asked about his wife, he said, She is my sister. For he was afraid to say my wife, thinking the men of this place might kill me on account of Rebekah, for she is beautiful. It came about when he had been there a long time that Abimelech, king of the Philistines, looked out through a window and saw. And behold, Isaac was caressing his wife, Rebekah. Then Abimelech called Isaac and said, Behold, certainly she is your wife. How then did you say she is my sister? 
And Isaac said to him, Because I said I might die on account of her. Abimelech said, What is this you have done to us? One of the people might easily have lain with your wife, and you would have brought guilt upon us. So Abimelech charged all the people, saying, He who touches this man or his wife shall surely be put to death. Well, now we really have a rerun, don't we? We thought the uh, famine was a rerun. This is absolutely a rerun. So not only do we have the traveling due to the famine, uh, but in this new place, when they show up, when the men want to know about Rebecca, Isaac says, she is my sister. And the text explains that he's scared that the locals might kill him on account of his beautiful wife. Well, where in the world did Isaac come up with that idea? Well, obviously, this is almost exactly what his father Abraham did, not once, but twice. Once with Pharaoh, king of Egypt, and once, perhaps, with this very same man, Abimelech, the king of the Philistines. Uh, I should also point out that Abimelech, like Pharaoh, uh, might be the name of the family. It might be a family dynasty kind of thing. It might be the position, kind of like a label, as we would use the word president or something like that. So not necessarily the same man, but it might have been the exact same man. I think um, that previous thing with Abraham might have been roughly 80 years earlier, if I've done that math correctly. So it'd be pretty amazing if the same guy was ruling as king. It's not impossible, but probably not too likely. So it may or may not have been the same Abimelech. Uh, might have been a son, maybe a successor of some kind. Uh, but previously, years earlier, God had warned Abimelech in a dream. This time, Abimelech kind of figures this out for himself, doesn't he? Um, this time, Abimelech just so happens to be looking out the window one day or whatever, and he notices Isaac caressing Rebekah. Ooh, this is terrible, you know? Uh, even pagan kings are apparently not okay with this at this point in history. I kind of think about Paul's comment in 1 Corinthians 5 that the church was tolerating something that even the pagans don't accept. Even the pagans don't uh, tolerate that kind of thing, that a man was living with his father's wife. That was the issue there in 1 Corinthians 5. And they were bragging, oh, we're such a loving congregation, you know, we're accepting and tolerant and that kind of thing. And Paul's like, no, you need to be mourning over this thing. You shouldn't be proud about such a thing. And so maybe in a slim, slightly similar way, Abimelech, he figures this out. Uh, a Hebrew has done it again, tricking him into thinking that his wife is actually his sister and all that. Uh, last time, Sarah was Abraham's half-sister, if you remember that study from a few weeks ago. Uh, but this time, this really doesn't seem to be the case at all. If you remember, Isaac and Rebekah are distantly related. We talked about that, you know, second cousin-in-law kind of thing. You know, who knows? There, there's this distant connection, but they're definitely not brother and sister. And definitely not half-brother and sister like Abraham and Sarah were. So I think we learn from this in terms of a practical lesson. And we'll get back to this toward the end of the lesson. But a practical lesson, practical takeaway here, is that our kids have a way of watching our behavior. And they have a way of escalating, even. And so they take our bad example and they build on it and they'll take it to a whole new level. And that's what we see here. Isaac has learned from his father, I think in a bad way. Um, Abraham had many good qualities, but this does not seem to be one of his strengths. Um, I mean, obviously, both men should have had faith that God would take care of them. And, and yet they found this workaround to try to, in fear... Uh, make sure that they didn't get killed in the process. Uh, in the rest of this passage, Abimelech pretty much lectures Isaac about how bad this was. Terrible things might have happened. If one of us had taken your wife, uh, we would have been guilty. And I would suggest Abimelech was concerned about being held accountable before God. Um, he's the king. He can marry whoever he wants to, but he also knows that he answers to a higher power. Uh, back in Genesis 20, God had warned Abimelech in a dream and said, Behold, you are a dead man. Because of this woman whom you have taken, for she is married. So remember, this is the patriarchal age. God communicates directly through heads of households. That's his general way of doing things back then. And God has already warned either Abimelech this man or Abimelech this man's predecessor uh, over this exact issue. And Abimelech does not want another lecture from God in, in the night. Doesn't want to have another vision in that way. And at the end here in Genesis 26, Abimelech warns all of his people, I will execute you if anybody touches uh, this man or his wife. So he kind of puts this shield of protection around this family. So let's continue tonight with Genesis 26 verses 12 through 17. Genesis 26, taking this paragraph by paragraph, Genesis 26, 12 through 17. Now Isaac sowed in that land 
and reaped in the same year a hundredfold. And the Lord blessed him, and the man became rich, and continued to grow richer until he became very wealthy, for he had possessions of flocks and herds and a great household, so that the Philistines envied him. Now all the wells which his father's servants had dug in the days of Abraham his father, the Philistines stopped up by filling them with earth. Then Abimelech said to Isaac, Go away from us, for you are too powerful for us. And Isaac departed from there and camped in the valley of Gerar and settled there. So now that Isaac has been promised protection by the local king, he sows and he reaps. And so he's safe to, to do some crops. And he's apparently planning on being there for a little bit. And he does well. He reaps a hundredfold compared to what he had sown. And I think we would obviously think in our minds as Christians about the parable of the sower over in Matthew chapter 13 when the seed landed on the good ground. You may remember some yielded a hundredfold, some 60 and some 30. And so a hundredfold then is apparently a huge return on the initial investment. That was the, you know, the most productive seed, at least in that parable that Jesus told. And so I'm kind of thinking about our own garden this year. And the, the most striking example to me was when we planted carrots. We planted carrots for probably 30 years now. Um, but the seeds, if you're familiar with planting carrots, the seeds for carrots are extremely small. Uh, they are tiny. Some of the smallest seeds that I deal with. And, and we planted enough seeds in our garden this year for maybe a, a four by four foot raised bed. The seeds weighed... I don't know, maybe half an ounce or something, and all of them piled together would fit on top of a dime. But the harvest in that little patch of ground was absolutely huge. Several buckets and large bowls overflowing with these beautiful carrots. So I don't know what Isaac planted, but it did very, very well. And it multiplied by a hundredfold, and he becomes very rich because of this. He continues getting rich until he becomes very wealthy. And I'm kind of thinking he was already wealthy in a sense because he inherited something from Abraham. Uh, but this is above and beyond wealthy. I mean, even to the point where the Philistines were noticing, you know, this man is rolling in money, basically. And they get envious. They wish they had what he had. And this leads to conflict. And notice they don't go to war with Isaac. I mean, obviously, that'd be a stupid move on their part because obviously, first of all, the king had threatened to kill anybody who touches Isaac or Rebekah, but also he's rich. He has people. And uh, his father, of course, had rustled up an army many years earlier and he could get things done. And so instead of attacking him head on, uh, basically the neighbors go to work behind the scenes. And in fact, this may be the classic example of passive aggressive behavior. And I was kind of thinking earlier today, this is the equivalent of, uh, you know, somebody cutting you off in traffic and you kind of following them from a distance and keying their car in the parking lot, you know, kind of making their life miserable, but in a way that they don't know it was you and uh, just a terrible thing to do. So instead of attacking Isaac directly, uh, notice the Philistines, they fill up Isaac's wells with dirt. And uh, these are wells that Abraham and his people had dug many years before. A well, of course, just incredibly valuable. It took a lot of time to dig these wells. I mean, finding the right place, uh, the structure, finding a way to get water out of it and lining it with stones. And it, just all kinds of work was involved here. And I, I think we can safely assume these, these uh, wells were strategically located. They wouldn't have dug a well where they didn't need one. So that they were needed in these places. So shepherds would travel with their flocks, and when they needed water, they would make sure that end up near one of these wells. Well, now when they get there, they find that they've been filled up. And I believe it would be pretty obvious for these people showing up to water their flocks that this is not by accident. You know, we were here a few months ago or last year, and this doesn't just happen. Somebody did this to us. Somebody filled up this well. And so this has obviously been done on purpose. But of course, without a a trail cam or a spy sitting there watching it, there's no way to prove this. So what can you do if uh, somebody fills up your well and you're not able to uh, see who did it? Um, and so Isaac can't really retaliate. He can't make this right. He can't make them redig it. He can't fix this problem. Well, starting in verse 16, it's interesting to see what happens next. We aren't told that Isaac confronts Abimelech. That's not what happens here. But instead, Abimelech confronts Isaac. Kind of backwards there, isn't it? And Abimelech invites Isaac to leave. You know, my people are filling up your wells. It's obviously time for you to go. Kind of in pushes him out the door, encourages him to get on going. So, you know, that would have been an interesting meeting between these two to see how that went down. Uh, but instead of pressing it, which he could have done, 
He could have done something, but instead of doing that, instead of forcing this issue, instead of going to war over this, uh, Isaac simply leaves and he pulls up his tents and apparently he goes and he camps elsewhere. Well, let's continue tonight with Genesis 25 verses 18 through 22. Genesis 25 verses 18 through 22. Then Isaac dug again the wells of water which had been dug in the days of his father Abraham. For the Philistines had stopped them up after the death of Abraham, and he gave them the same names which his father had given them. But when Isaac's servants dug in the valley and found there a well of flowing water, the herdsmen of Gerar quarreled with the herdsmen of Isaac, saying, The water is ours. So he named the well Esek because they contended with him. Then they dug another well, and they quarreled over it too, so he named it Sitna. He moved away from there and dug another well, and they did not quarrel over it. So he named it Rehoboth, for he said, At last the Lord has made room for us, and we will be fruitful in the land. So again, notice, instead of going to war over these wells getting filled in, Isaac simply redigs the wells that his father had dug, and he gave them the same names that they had back in the time of his father. And kind of an interesting note, just on being a neighbor, um, obviously we have permission, I think, from God to confront issues and deal with stuff, but there are some times where the relationship might be worth not doing that. I don't know if that makes sense, but there are some times where we can just take some stuff that happens to us and maybe do it in a different way to make peace between two people with, without just going full-blown war against somebody. But anyway, he moves along a little bit. He redigs the wells, gives them the same names. Now they have wells of flowing water once again. Does this solve the problem? Obviously not. Now apparently the people who filled in the wells start complaining that the water is theirs. So that's just a messed up situation. And now we do have a series of quarrels. These are disagreements or fights. And if I've counted correctly, I think they dig and redig three times in addition to the first time. And Isaac finally gets far enough away, as I understand this, where they finally leave him alone. And he renames these wells along the way again with the names that are tied to the circumstances this time. So let's continue tonight with Genesis 26, verses 23 through 25. Genesis 26, 23 through 25. Then he went up from there to Beersheba, and the Lord appeared to him the same night and said, I am the God of your father Abraham. Do not fear, for I am with you. I will bless you and multiply your descendants for the sake of my servant Abraham. So he built an altar there and called upon the name of the Lord and pitched his tent there. And there Isaac's servants dug a well. Well, as he travels, Isaac comes to Beersheba. God appears to him in the night. And I believe this now may be at least the second time God appears to Isaac. Previously, he'd appeared to Abraham, but now uh, Isaac is the head of the family. Abraham's uh, passed away. And as God did with Abraham, he's now giving this reminder to Isaac. So uh, like a, a reminder of the promise. So this is not new information, but this is coming uh, along with some encouragement. Uh, don't do not fear. I'm with you. And because of this, Isaac builds an altar and calls upon the name of the Lord. And just a note, calling on the name of the Lord is not just saying some words. It's not just saying, Lord. Um, I'm, obviously, Jesus warned about, you know, there would be a time when people would call on him, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name? You know, that's not going to do it. So calling on the name of the Lord is more than just saying the word Lord. And we see that here. In this case, he actually builds an altar. And we assume when you build an altar, he probably offered a sacrifice on it, although that's not stated specifically. But at the end of this passage, he once again uh, digs another well. So let's continue with Genesis 26, verses 26 through 33. Genesis 26, 26 through 33. Then Abimelech came to him from Gerar with his advisor Ahuzath and Phicol, the commander of his army. Isaac said to them, Why have you come to me? Since you hate me and have sent me away from you. They said, We see plainly that the Lord has been with you. So we said, Let there now be an oath between us, even between you and us, and let us make a covenant with you, that you will do us no harm, just as we have not touched you and have done to you nothing but good and have sent you away in peace. You are now blessed of the Lord. Then he made them a feast and they ate and drank. In the morning they arose early and exchanged oaths. Then Isaac sent them away and they departed from him in peace. Now it came about on the same day that Isaac's servants came in and told him about the well which they had dug and said to him, We have found water. So he named it Sheba. Therefore, the name of the city is Beersheba to this day. Well, how interesting. Even as Isaac is in the process of moving farther away, Abimelech still seems scared, doesn't he? 
and he's kind of having some regrets about letting, you know, kind of being mad at this powerful man, and he's leaving, and what's going to happen next? And so as I understand this, Abimelech basically chases Isaac down and asks for a treaty, uh, for an agreement between them. And <laughs> Isaac is clearly shocked by this as well. In verse 27, why have you come to me since you hate me? Why, why are you here? You know, you made me leave, so why did you chase me down? But Abimelech and his people, they want this agreement. So just as we haven't done you any harm, which really isn't the truth. I mean, they haven't killed each other yet. They haven't maybe physically harmed each other. Uh, but in the same way, we want you to promise not to harm us either. So please don't kill us. And of course, the not doing any, any harm part is not true at all. Officially, but behind the scenes, I mean, obviously Abimelech's people have been harassing Isaac right out of the area by filling in all those wells. But ultimately, though, I mean, Isaac agrees, okay, fine, would kind of be, in my mind, the, the attitude there. They feast together, they part ways, and the bonus here is that Isaac's servants dig a well, they find water uh, yet again, and they name this one uh, Beersheba. And I believe we still have the well of Beersheba to this day. There's a well in a place called Beersheba. There are pictures of it online. I remember we've shared pictures of that well in our in our worship assemblies before. Uh, but let's conclude tonight with Genesis chapter 26 verses 34 and 35. The very end here. Genesis 26, 34 and 35. When Esau was 40 years old, he married Judith, the daughter of Beeri the Hittite, and Basemath, the daughter of Elon the Hittite, and they brought grief to Isaac and Rebekah. So in the last couple verses, we've got just a quick update on Esau. Remember, Esau is the firstborn, but he had sold his birthright to Jacob. But, uh, here, though, we find Esau marries Judith. Uh, I had forgotten that Judith, or Judy, is a Bible name. Did you know that? I don't know if you knew that Judith was a Bible name. Uh, not really a, a hero of this story, necessarily, but it is found in the Bible, which is interesting. And I know I've read that before. It just uh, didn't hit me in that way. I had forgotten that, but... Um, and we find in this passage, Judith is the son of a Hittite. And so Judith is a foreigner. She is an outsider. And Esau then also marries Basemath, a Hittite as well. So we would note here that Esau does not marry from among his own people, um, as his father would have wanted him to do. But he marries one of the uh, local pagans. And we find that Esau and his wives bring grief to Isaac and Rebekah. And a very unfortunate situation there for a, for a son to bring grief to his parents. Uh, but this brings us to the end of Genesis 26. In terms of some practical application of this chapter, I would just go back and highlight briefly once again the fact that kids have a way of following their parents' example. In good ways, but also in bad ways. Obviously, there are no perfect parents. But on the other hand, at the same time, obviously, some parents are better than others. And we absolutely see this with Abraham and Sarah. Uh, next week, we hope to come back to uh, look together again at uh, Genesis 27. We'll take a look at Jacob's deception. And with that, thank you for joining us tonight. I hope to see you this coming Lord's Day morning at 930. We've just started a brand new study of Ephesians. But we actually started Ephesians by looking at the background of that congregation in the book of Acts. So if you want to catch up, that's Acts chapter 19. But if you were not with us on Sunday, this would be a great time to jump in. Uh, I wouldn't say that you're not missing anything. I'm just saying that you'll be able to jump in with chapter 1. So we looked at the background information. Now we're ready for the book of Ephesians itself. So come prepared by reading the book of Ephesians and be ready for a good discussion. And then after class, we plan on coming together at 1030 for the worship assembly. Uh, let's close tonight by going to God in prayer. Our Father in heaven, you are the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And we realize when we read the Bible, you are identified in this way so many times. And tonight, we have a deeper appreciation of what this really means. We know that you look for faithfulness. We also know that you are a God of mercy, and you are a God who gives second chances and even more. We pray that we would not take advantage of this, but that we would follow the example of the great men and women of faith as they put their trust in you. Thank you, Father, for the promises of Jesus. We come to you in his name. Amen.